Okay, welcome to prime time at EMC World, The Cube. Now we have a new format. Every Cube event we go to, we try to bring in prime time news around the event that's orbiting around the news here. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante here for our editorial uh, prime time segment. Dave, obviously breaking analysis coming next. We're going to do uh, a review of what happened in, the, in the, our news program this morning around, around EMC World and storage and all that innovation. Um, but to set the table, the big theme is transformation. Uh, not just here at EMC World, but around the world, around for CIOs and enterprises. Whether you're an enterprise for businesses or an enterprise for a large cloud service provider. Enterprises and, and clouds need innovation. They need to have really massive growth in infrastructure. So Dave, I've got to ask you, okay, it's a balancing act. We heard from Vic, from EMC, CIO, that it's no brainer, the C-level suites have to transform the business. But the IT doesn't have the IQ, some say, as we say, and they need more skills. They got to move faster. They got to add more value. They have to invest massive growth. What is this balancing act for the CIO? Um, a realistic view that they face. Um, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, the sassification of businesses is not that easy. Yeah, I think, I think it, uh, CIOs are shifting their businesses from really focusing a lot on non-differentiated heavy lifting, a lot of infrastructure man management. We always hear about the 70-30 pie, people spend 70% of their time keeping the lights on, 30% of their time innovating. A lot of that keeping the lights on is because of that non-differentiated heavy li lifting, infrastructure management, if the infrastructure deployment, you know, keeping it up and available, and then, and then making the applications work on that infrastructure. We've seen the DevOps trend, the hyperscale trend, a lot of these modern, you know, infrastructures and modern thinking come into the data center really through the hyperscale guys, it's starting to seep into the enterprise. The, the challenge is that a lot of the hyperscale, you know, think about Facebook, we're talking about Google, you're talking about, you know, largely very few applications serving, you know, hundreds of millions of users versus, you know, many, many hundreds or thousands of applications versus, you know, serving several thousand users. So the infrastructure, the applications within the data center are just, way much more complicated, and that's the balancing act right there. Okay, so now let's just drill down on cloud and data. So obviously the data-driven businesses, analytics, et cetera, is driving the real-time business transformation. Not only just how they're rolling out, but how they get information. But the infrastructure right now is where the rapid change is. Dave, storage is at the center of the value proposition. We've been saying it since 2010. What is the update right now? What do CIOs need to focus on relative to storage and, and their software environments now with the data center operating system? Well, storage, you know, to date has been an expensive container that's purpose-built for a particular workload and application, and that's changing with the advent of, you know, <laughs> Intel cores and super-fast microprocessors and the cost coming down in flash, you know, the whole architecture is changing where you can now run that on a software layer without massive degradations in performance. So, I think CIOs are transforming the infrastructure from uh, a container to one that is much more agile, much more uh, facile and to, to change and way lower cost so they can spend more money on that innovation that we talked about and part of that is big data analytics and other processes and people to develop new applications. One of the great things I love about working with you Dave is we have the Cube and we have our, our respective operations, the research and the publishing and the TV and the data science working together and we get to peek into the future and we're always pointing at the most relevant things in the future we did with software-led infrastructure and big data. And we've covered that, we continue to cover that. That's growing like crazy. But now, in our recent CUBE events and recent research, you have enterprises and clouds looking down the barrel of OpenStack, AWS, application tsunamis, data-driven and mobile apps, and API economy in the data center. What is your take on making all that work. From a CIO's perspective, they're looking at software-led infrastructure and big data, no problem, they get that, but now they're looking at other dynamics. Amazon, OpenStack, apps, and APIs. Final word. Well, I think you're right on, John. I mean, Amazon has basically taken this complex data center with all these wires and all this code and all this just stuff and turned it into an API. And not only have they turned it into an API, they turned it into an API with 
a rapid acceleration of services that you can you know, buy with a credit card. And so that is a, a totally transformative. So now, most CIOs don't have the resources, you called it you know, ITIQ, they don't have the resources to, to mimic that, but they're going to use a combination of outsourcing to companies like Amazon and partnerships with companies like EMC and IBM and HP and others to actually bring that hyperscale-like capability into their own operations. Okay, well we're going to, we're going to go right to uh, our Dallas operation. We're going to hear from what's on the news today. Obviously a lot going on, Acer, Windows RT, 3D printers. Um, experts say Bitcoin is here to stay. And obviously um, a lot of amazing tech networking technology and storage. So we're going to go right to Dallas right now and hear from our news desk on what's happening today. Time. Good morning, I'm Kristen Folletti and welcome to News Desk on SiliconANGLE TV for Tuesday, May 6th. It's Monday, May 6th, 2013. Since its creation, Bitcoin has come under scrutiny over its plausibility as a currency. Now Canada wants to deploy taxes on Bitcoin transactions. Join us now to provide his breaking analysis surrounding Bitcoin's infrastructure is SiliconANGLE founding editor, Mark Risen Hopkins. Morning, Mark, happy Monday. Good morning. <laughs> Just in time for Canadian tax season, the Canada Revenue Agency says that users of Bitcoins will have to pay taxes on their Bitcoin transactions, stating that there are two separate tax rules that apply to the electronic currency, depending on whether they are used as money to buy things or if they were merely bought and sold for speculative purposes. Mark, there's been a lot of debate about whether Bitcoin even counts as a legitimate currency. So what are your thoughts on the taxation of Bitcoins? Is it fair? Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's, I guess, a philosophical question as to whether taxes and uh, income taxes are fair uh, in and of themselves. I'll, I'll try to leave that aside uh, for this conversation um, and just assume that taxes are fair <laughs> at, at, the, at face value and, and talk about whether or not taxes are fair for Bitcoin. Um, so uh, any country um, presumably has the right to tax uh, its citizenry and the, the money within its borders in the way that it sees fit, whether it be an income tax or, a, or a, some sort of a commercial tax or, or something like that, or uh, taxes on, on, on business itself, um, or any of the you know thousands and thousands of taxes that exist, dozens of different types. Uh, so I'd have to say that it's fair for Canada to decide to tax it, just as it was fair when America said that. So America hasn't initially... Uh, or made, made any initial statements specifically to Bitcoin and, and what is fair to tax or what they intend to tax on Bitcoin. But the assumption that everyone in the, uh, that has operated with Bitcoin has uh, uh, worked with uh, has basically said, hey, look, we're going we're gonna to treat this as if it were any other type of currency income. And we're going to report our earnings. I mean, I guess there's people out there that are trading on Silk Road and buying and selling illicit substances that are not going to report their earnings. But I don't think they were going to. Uh, regardless if they were using Bitcoin or not. The vast majority of transactions on Bitcoin are legitimate, and most people that are doing uh, transactions uh, to a great enough uh, uh, value, uh, i.e. the taxable amounts, are reporting that on their income. I know I did, uh, and I didn't really do a whole lot of Bitcoin transaction, but what little I did was included in my, uh, my tax in income tax this year. So do we know how other countries have approached Bitcoin when it comes to taxes? Has there been a lot of talk about this? Oh yeah, it's, it's something that was talked about very early on. Uh, and you know, it's, it's interesting because there was a, a story in Wired earlier today uh, that it was called uh, Bitcoin not as secure or safe from regulation as you thought it was. And basically it makes the point by, it was by uh, Daniel Kaminsky who's, who did a very good job uh, kind of showing all the the, the different aspects and strong points and weak points of Bitcoin. But one of the things he pointed out is, look, every transaction is done in public. Uh, and if you dodge your taxes or avoid your taxes uh, for long enough with Bitcoin to such a, 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 into a great amount, it's not going to be a difficult uh, detective work to, to try to track you down. Um, it's, it's only pseudonymity. So uh, as soon as you make a purchase, 
um, you know, with a, with a wallet that you own uh, and they start to backtrack that to you, um, you know, it's only a matter of time before they figure out all the other little parts of your, your wallet uh, on the blockchain and, you know, they could come after you for some amount of, uh, of uh, untaxed or, or income that hasn't been taxed and you're in all kinds of trouble. So it's better to be safe uh, than sorry. Do you feel that the taxing of bitcoins is a good thing or a bad thing? Does it give more weight and legitimacy to the currency, or does it turn those users away who find the appeal of bitcoin in its anonymity? See, I don't think taxing bitcoins really airs uh, any kind of legitimacy. You can you can tax a rock uh, in this world. I mean, it's you, you can anything that has any kind of perceived value uh, will end up getting taxed by the government, uh, and you don't even have to be alive to get taxed. So, I mean. I, I think, but it would be, I think what would lend it some uh, more weight and legitimacy than Bitcoin currently has, I guess, would be for the IRS or the CRA to uh, accept Bitcoin as payment for your taxes. As we talked, to, I don't know if we talked about it here on the show, if it was just on the, uh, a blog post that we, we published, but there was a, a government agency, uh, actually a government contractor that processes the, uh, the, the municipal fines and uh, payments for, you know, thousands and thousands of cities across America that is now accepting Bitcoin as payment, which did air an, uh, uh, some, some legitimacy or some additional legitimacy. I think as we see these types of things where governments are taking payment in Bitcoin increase, then we can talk about legitimacy, increased legitimacy for Bitcoin as a currency. A study of the Bitcoin exchange industry has found that 45% of exchanges fail. The study conducted by computer scientists Tyler Moore and Nicholas Kristen followed 40 exchanges on the web and concluded that of the 40, 18 have gone out of business, 13 of which closed without warning, and five closing after, after suffering security breaches, and four other exchanges suffered serious attacks but remained open. MT Gox, the largest Bitcoin exchange, is one of those exchanges recently falling victim to a huge number of DDoS attacks over the past month during a Bitcoin surge. Mark, do you think MT Gox is becoming a weak link in Bitcoin's infrastructure? Uh, so this is uh, actually a, a hotly contested point within the Bitcoin community, uh, within and without. Um, mostly because because MT Gox handles, as they say in their website, eighty percent of uh, Bitcoin to dollar transactions. Um, there, it's a it's very difficult to say that this is not a weak link. You're only as strong as your weakest link. Bitcoin itself is a de decentralized currency. So uh, technically, MT Gox could go offline tomorrow and never come back, and Bitcoin itself would not be uh, fundamentally affected. Here's the problem, though. Uh, Bitcoin has a liquidity issue. It cannot exist without, it cannot uh, persist, I should say, without the existence of, of marketplaces like MT Gox. And um, because you, there's, there's not a, a like kind of a default way to transfer dollars to Bitcoin and back. Now there's there's a growing kind of secondary local market that that is starting to take a lot more uh, prevalence over some of the uh, the smaller uh, centralized markets like MT Gox or uh, Bitfloor, these other ones that exist out there. But they don't they kind of pale in comparison when it comes to transaction volume to MT Gox. So yes, it's a weak link. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, that uh, I think MT Gox is going to go down tomorrow. They have amazing security and they've withstood every attack so far. There's a reason why they have 80 percent of the transactions in Bitcoin for Bitcoin to dollar. But um, yeah, they're a weak link. Anytime you have something centralized as a weak link, and many Bitcoin enthusiasts and early adopters are calling for. Uh, the creation of, if not necessarily in, in it, uh, make it part of the Bitcoin uh, uh, standard itself, but maybe the creation of a, uh, of a marketplace that is decentralized in the same manner that Bitcoin is. So there's not a central site that you go to, but uh, a protocol that you use. Mark, we know all investments inherently come with a deal of risk, but does Bitcoin come with more risks than potential rewards? And how is Bitcoin doing at the moment? So there was an interesting little write-up in the Wall Street Journal this morning uh, about uh, kind of like where uh, some of the founders see Bitcoin, f founders of uh, the, kind of the Bitcoin open standard and key contributors see it going and see uh, the benefits. Of course, the benefits are, are, are well known and talked about if you if you do any searches on the web for Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, decentralized, not controlled by a government. And, you know, we can go on and on. We've talked about these things before. Um, the risks are obvious. It's a volatile currency. Um, and 
uh, it remains to be seen whether or not this volatility uh, is inherent to the currency or if it's something that will dissipate over time. Um, it's been, uh, I think, three years, basically, two or three years since I started tracking. Uh, so it's two and a half years since I started tracking um, the, the, the price index on MTGOX as compared to press mentions. And uh, it's almost still to this day one to one. You can see the little knee of the curve as it goes up on uh, the press mentions and the same thing on the MTGOX spot price. Um, that's not a good thing when your currency uh, can be uh, manipulated by the press or, or by numbers of press mentions because ways of manipulating press mentions and press buzz are myriad numerous. They write books about it. So um, are the risks worth the reward? I think so. I personally uh, think that uh, despite all these risks and all these kind of uh, weak spots in, in the early development of Bitcoin, uh, there's there, there's still a lot more reward than risk uh, because uh, you know there, we don't.